just to clarify in case anybody's wondering, Tibor speaks English, but Tibor does not. <laughs> or not as much, right? <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. So, so, so if, if, when, I, when, not if, <laughs> when I start speaking way too fast, raise one hand. Okay. If I'm still speaking too fast, raise two hands. <laughs> if I'm still speaking too fast, ask the Holy Spirit to translate. A very short passage this morning that we're going to look at in Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 35 to 37. Really short, very simple little thing. Over the last few weeks, we've been going through the study of Mark 12. Is that mine? Over the last few weeks, we've been going through a study uh, of Mark. In fact, we're going through this whole series trying to learn about what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, and how do we do that. Jesus, in the last few weeks, has been being asked questions by the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and the questions are all meant to try to trap Jesus and to somehow make him look stupid in front of the people, right? Right? They're trying to cause the people not to believe in Jesus because they're concerned that way too many of the crowds are following Jesus. They've listened to the crowds get excited about his miracles and, and the fact that they've actually, the crowd has actually called him Son of David. They've, they came in, you might remember, by the way, we're in Holy Week, the week that Jesus died on the cross. We're right in the middle of that week on Wednesday. On Sunday, the Sunday we refer to as Palm Sunday, on Sunday, as he was coming down into Jerusalem, the crowds are walking with him. They've got palm branches there waving. And incidentally, these are crowds that are coming from outside of Jerusalem, probably even outside of Israel, that, that, that have been coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And as they're coming down, they see Jesus, and they're, they're singing out, and they're waving the branches and saying, Jesus, Son of David! And they're celebrating that. So much so, and we'll see this in a moment when I get to one of the texts, that, that the Pharisees actually get indignant, is the word. <laughs> they get indignant. They get upset at the fact that Jesus is allowing the people to call him son of David. Why does that bother them? Because to call him son of David means he is the Messiah. It's the term that they've used throughout Old Testament prophecy. And they believe that that's the term that should be used. And so it bothers them. He's being referred to as the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one sent from God. <laughs> but this morning, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes are done with their questions. I think you would be too if you'd ask a question and look like a fool when you asked it. And publicly you've been saying things and every time you think you've got him trapped, he comes up with a brilliant, incredible response. And so now Jesus says, okay, now that, and he doesn't quite say it this way, but I'm paraphrasing, okay. Now that you're done with all of your questions, I have one to ask you. Let's look at his question, Mark 12. 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? A large crowd listened to him with delight. Let's go to that last phrase just for a minute. The large crowd listened to him with delight. If that isn't an understatement, uh, it, that is like anticlimactic. 
Jesus has just been saying something incredible. He's been pointing out to them a brand new lesson about the Messiah. And what he's saying in this lesson is the Messiah is God. And how do the people respond? Uh, they listen to him with delight. <laughs> delight? Isn't that what you do with ice cream? Right? Or chocolate cake or some other kind of goodie or potato chips or something? I mean, but they listen to him with delight? That's all. Oh, yeah. The, oh, that's delightful. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are they not getting what he has just said? He's literally said the very thing that's going to cause him to be crucified on Friday. He is going to die because he's going to be accused of blasphemy. And he's giving them all the ammunition to say that with what he's saying right here. He said, David is saying that the Messiah is God. I am the son of David. I am the Messiah, and I am the great I am. And isn't that what he will say when the high priest asks him? After he's punched him and abused him, and he finally says, All right, in the name of Jehovah God, are you? The Christ. And how will Jesus respond? You've said it. I am. The Messiah. The Messiah is supposed to be the son of David. We've all heard that. Come on, right? And if you were a good Jew, every Jew knows that the Messiah will come from the lineage of King David. The Messiah can't be from any other lineage. In fact, the throne of David will be restored through the Messiah. Now, what we also believed was is that the Messiah would come back and he would set up a rule. He would be a military leader just like King David was. He didn't, he'd defeat the enemies and he'd sit down next to God on a throne because we know that the Messiah is the son of David turn with me if you will, have got your Bibles to Psalm 110 this is the Psalm that Jesus is actually quoting that that Jews and all Jewish scribes and all would use this Psalm this is one of the strongest messianic Psalms in all of the Old Testament in fact this is maybe one of the verses that is quoted more than anything else in the New Testament. Constantly the, ver the Bible comes back to this psalm and declares that the Messiah is the son of David. Psalm 110, 1 to 7. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a book brook along the way, and so he will lift his head on high. As Jesus quotes this psalm, what is he trying to teach? What's, what's the message that he's trying to get across to us? First off, he's saying that all, of all the titles of the Messiah, the most common title that was used for the Messiah was Son of David. Jews look forward to a God-sent deliverer who would be from David's line. And the text, you can find them, there are many. One, by the way, I wanted to point out this morning from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. Listen to this. The one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him 
as one mourns for an only child. And they will grieve bitterly for him as one who grieves for a firstborn son. Alan Carr, in speaking of this text, said, In that society, a father would never call his son Lord. Never. A father never rendered that kind of honor to a child. Children were considered property and never superior to their fathers. Yet David looks at this one who is to be his son, and David calls him what? Lord. This is a declaration that the Messiah is to be more than a man. He is to be a God-man. Well, we all know it, right? Jesus is a son of David. By the time Jesus was born, there were probably thousands of people who were sons of David. So what makes Jesus stand out? Luke gives his genealogy, and in Luke's genealogy, he ties David to Adam and God. Matthew does a similar genealogy, but in Matthew's genealogy, he goes from Abraham through David to Jesus. Luke 1 says this, He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And that's the prophecy before Jesus is even born. Throughout Jesus' ministry, the people have been referring to him as the Son of God. <laughs> they see him as Messiah. Why? Why do they see Jesus as the Son of David, as the Messiah? Well, first off, his miracles. In fact, let's go through several texts. Matthew 9, 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us! Who? Son of David. It was the miracles that Jesus performed that caused them to say, Hey, this has got to be the Messiah. Matthew 12, 23. All the people were astonished and said, Is it possible? Could this be the son of David? Matthew 15, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. What will he do for her? Cast out the demon. It's by the miracles and the power of Jesus that he demonstrates that he is son of David. Matthew 20, 30, two blind men were sitting alongside the road, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Lord. Son of David, have mercy on us. And then I referred to this earlier, Matthew 21, verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, and this is as he's coming down into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us, Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then you've got to jump forward to verse 15. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, take note, they saw the miracles. You see, they, they can't deny that Jesus hasn't performed these miracles. They can't deny that Jesus hasn't done incredible things. They saw the wonderful things. And isn't that interesting too? <laughs> they saw the wonderful things that he did. And they saw the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. And Matthew says, and they became indignant. In fact, if you continue reading the story, you'll find that they come to Jesus and say, why are you allowing the children to do this? You know, Jesus tells us, if we don't praise him, the very rocks are going to cry out. So what Jesus, what Jesus is saying by this simple yet profound question, son of David, he said to my Lord, 
sit at my right. He, he's saying, by him calling him Lord. Oh, by the way, we need to pause there, don't we? When Jesus uses these terms, he's using the terms that have been used throughout Hebrew history. When God introduced himself to Moses, he said, I am Yahweh. We use the word Jehovah. But if you'll notice, and you look in, your, look in your Bibles, most of you will have this, in the Old Testament, you'll find that oftentimes you'll find Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's when the Old Testament is using the name of God, Jehovah. Now here's some more pieces to that. The word Jehovah had three vowels. Do you hear it? Je Yehovah. Yehovah. Those three vowels are all put into another word, Adonai. Adonai. Adonai is the word for Lord. So they will take those three and they use those letters and because they felt that it was such a holy thing that you did not use the name of God. That God was so holy that you didn't speak his name. So instead you would say Adonai. When in fact, what you were speaking of was Yahweh, Yehovah, God himself. And here's what's coming home now. Jesus is saying, yeah, I am the son of David. I am God. Do you remember what Peter said at Pentecost? He gets up at Pentecost and, and, and relate this back to the passage I read earlier in Zechariah where it says that they're going to cry out and grieve, right? And they're going to grieve at the death of the one who's been pierced <laughs> Does that sound like anything familiar to you? About being pierced on a cross? And remember what Peter says in Acts 2, 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. We already know that. Religious leaders said they saw wonderful things that he had done. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. You didn't have control. God was in control. And you, with the help of wicked men, the Romans, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And David said about him, here's Psalm 110 again, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My, my body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. 